Chuck Olenek, a Marine actor. And that means I wear funny clothes and try to recreate history in order to understand it better and to tell the story. Well, I did that for 36 years in the classroom. That's why I now have a room at the house that's just filled to capacity with garb from uh, different centuries and different time periods. So I have all that garb sitting around. I don't have classroom anymore. I still have a passion for bringing the past to life. And I have a desire to preserve landmarks since landmarks tend to go away. So what I'm doing right now is I'm engaged in a very pretentious sounding mission odyssey where I visit each of the sites in Alta, California that had to do with the mission period and afterwards. So the missions themselves, the Asistencias, those are the spin-off missions uh, that are intended to grow up to be full-fledged missions on their own, the Estancias, which are the ranchos that supported the missions, and sometimes they grow up into Asistancias, maybe the missions themselves. The Presidios, those are the fortifications designed to protect the missions. So, today's expedition, today's adventure, is I am returning to mission San Luis Obispo, the fifth mission founded in the chain. And ideally, I would have been doing all the missions in one savage burn, but I discovered I've had to return to the scene of the crime a number of times because there was just so much information to record and to talk about. So this should be my third trip involving Mission San Luis Obispo. And I hope you stick with me on this journey. Grim times were in store for the mission that was built in the Valley of the Bears. When I was looking at Mission San Luis Obispo and doing my research, I've got to confess, I didn't think pirates would be a part of the equation. Except that, well, you know, I, I tend to think of San Luis Obispo as more inland, but Morro Bay was pretty close by. That was like a uh, major port for, you know, a shipping area for the hide trade and all sorts of stuff. So, okay, it does enter into the equation. Well, in November and December of 1818, Philippe Bouchard, the privateer from Argentina, who was actually a pirate because his letters uh, from the government had expired, was threatening the coast of Alta California. He had already burned the Presidio at Monterey and the governor of uh, Sola was freaking out and warning the uh, missions and warning the Presidios to prepare for this guy. And what ended up happening is, I believe the uh, people from Mission San Luis Obispo retreated 11 miles up the Cuesta to the Asistencia Santa Margarita. And the main building was a stone structure that was pretty large. So that would serve as a great fortification, a great place of shelter. And it was 11 miles and it was up the quest and it's uphill, which hopefully was going to discourage the pirates. Of course, Bouchard never landed here. He ended up uh, sailing on to uh, Rancho Nuestra Señora uh, del Refugio near Santa Barbara. San Luis Obispo, while it doesn't participate in the Chumash Revolt, gets uh, to help out a whole bunch of refugees who ended up fleeing Mission La Purisima, and they fled northward about 60 miles, and so at least they were taking care of the refugees. Even though Padre Martinez had made Mission San Luis Obispo very successful, 
he finally stepped on one too many toes or perhaps the wrong toes and was arrested on February 3rd, 1830 for disloyalty to the new government of Mexico, which had won its independence from Spain. He was held incommunicado at the Santa Barbara Presidio, found guilty and deported later in 1830. But he had the last laugh on the civil authorities. Predicting the results of secularization, he allowed the mission properties to fall into some disrepair before the end of his tenure. This would reduce the plunder value. In the 1830s, secularization is looming. It's a threat to the missions and the mission system is starting to fall apart. And it's not simply that land is being sold off by the governor. There are some other issues that are taking place. The Yokuts and also the Miwok are getting involved in stealing cattle and stealing horses. And there are more runaways from the missions who are joining up with them. And now the raids are starting to get really expensive to the point where um, Mission San Luis Obispo lost a thousand head of cattle in one raid. So this was becoming a very great issue for the Mexican government. And the settlers who kept petitioning the uh, military to do something, and they were pretty unsuccessful. What they thought about doing after a while, because their expeditions, the punitive expeditions were so dangerous and costly, there was an idea of building forts in the passes to, that the uh, Indians were using to block up the passes and try to keep uh, Mexican holdings safe. And that says something very important about the thinking of the Mexican government, the Mexican military. They went from offense to thinking defense. Mexico followed through on its plans to secularize the missions in the 1830s. By 1845, Pio Pico, the last Mexican governor of Alta California, sold Mission San Luis Obispo for the sum of $510. Understand that the mission, which had originally been valued at $70,000, sold for $510. By this point, most of the Chumash had taken off. Of course, in the mid-1840s, the Mexican War is going to happen, so that's going to change things dramatically, and suddenly the Mexican government has other things to worry about besides the native Californians. In 1846, the Mexican War began. John C. Fremont had marched south from Monterey with the California Battalion, a group of 430 volunteers. And by December 11th, they'd seized control of Mission San Miguel Archangel. And by the 13th, they'd seized control of the Asistencia at Santa Margarita, where they caught a Chumash who was carrying a message at the behest of Don Pico, who was in San Luis Obispo. At this point, the Chumash was executed and um, Joaquin Estrada, who owned uh, the former Asistencia, you know, now that was his rancho, he and everyone else at Santa Margarita were threatened with being arrested unless they swore loyalty. And they did so. Now, Fremont's going to march south. And when he gets to San Luis Obispo, he was given information that the mission was occupied by a band of Mexican insurrectionists and surrounded it with his 430-man California battalion. The insurrectionists turned out to be a handful of women and children. Fremont and his battalion quartered here. What he ends up doing is he arrests 
Don Pico, who was in charge here and who had sent the message, arrested him for treason and he put him on trial and he was found guilty. Pico was going to be executed, but after a few days, Fremont changed his mind. Following this, Fremont marched south. He was supposed to follow the red line you're seeing on the map, which would have taken him through Gaviota Pass and then along the coast to Santa Barbara. But he had heard that there was an ambush lying in wait for him and so took his troops through San Marcos Pass and descended into a largely abandoned Santa Barbara. And from there, he marched on to Mission San Fernando and then to Coenga, where the Treaty of Coenga was signed and California was out of the Mexican War. With victory in the Mexican War going to the United States, California will become a state in 1850 and now everything everything is going to get divided up differently the state will be divided into 27 counties and san luis obispo will become a county seat not the mission but at least the city and everybody who owned land under mexican land grants or spanish land grants had to reapply for their land and they sometimes didn't get it San Luis Obispo was the first town incorporated in the newly formed San Luis Obispo County. Early in the American period, the region was well known for lawlessness, gaining the nickname Barrio del Tigre, or Tiger Town, because of the problem. Robberies and murders that left no witnesses were carried out along the Camino Real and elsewhere around San Luis Obispo for years. At last, a gang of eight men committed a robbery with three murders and a kidnapping in May of 1858, leaving two living witnesses, which brought about the formation of a vigilance committee in the county that killed one, the suspected leader, and lynched six others, a total of seven men suspected of such misdeeds. Members of the committee remained influential members of the community for decades. The ranchos remained focused on cattle after the conquest of California. With the discovery of gold, the county experienced a major economic surge with the rising price of beef, but the emigrants flooding in also brought other things. The population of uh, the city itself was maybe a dozen white men, half of them, as this was described in one account, half of them were Americans, and there were several hundred um, Mexicans and uh, Native Americans, you know, former neophytes. And this is the era of the gold rush. You know, and even though like the big strikes aren't happening, there's a lot of immigrants coming in. So you have people coming in looking for their, their golden dream. Well, not everyone's gonna find it. And there's a man named Moss who uh, will show up and he will bring his wife along. He's also going to bring cholera. And when he realizes that he's really, really sick, he retreats to an adobe where he passes on and miners from up north uh, hear about his wife and they basically come collect her. End of his story. But now you got to deal with the cholera that is going through San Luis Obispo and it is mowing down the Native Americans because they don't have any resistance to this and they are dying in vast numbers. Well there's a man named uh, William Breck who decides it's his job he's gonna go bury them and he does this single-handedly wheeling their bodies in a wheelbarrow up a hill to bury them and he's doing this by himself and often working at night and uh, I believe he ended up burying about 70 before the epidemic died out and it died out basically due to no more victims to for the disease to attack responding to an 1853 petition in 1859 President James Buchanan returned some of the mission lands back to the church 
but the mission itself was decaying. In the 1880s, the front portico and bell loft were removed when weakened by an earthquake. An attempt was made to modernize the structures, and the colonnades along the front of the convento wing were raised, and the church and residence were covered with wooden clapboard. A New England-style belfry was added. The changes protected the structure from further decay, although significantly altering the facade of the buildings. It wouldn't be until the 1830s when restoration would finally begin. On June 22, 2020, the statue of Padre Serra, which stood before Mission San Luis Obispo, was removed amid re-examining controversies surrounding abuses of Native Californians. So we have, as far as the count, I believe it's six assistencias, and we also have two presidios out of the way, a few estancias, some old mission dams, and we've accomplished ten missions. So, onward to the Asistencia Santa Margarita, just a few miles away up the Cuesta. I hope you stick with me.